Let us pray. We gather this morning to acknowledge the mystery that we are not alone, God. The mystery that you are, that you breathe life into us. The mystery that the whole of creation is full of you and that you come to us in the beauty of the earth and in our encounters with others, our loved ones, our friends, the stranger. We are here to listen together for the word you have for us. So open our hearts and minds, help us to set aside distractions and to focus on the truth revealed to us in Jesus. Amen. It's almost comical. In one corner you have the Pharisee, in the other corner you have the tax collector. The Pharisee told the truth. He really was not like thieves, rogues, adulterers, or like the tax collector. He really did fast twice a week and give a tenth of all his income, not just the net, but the gross. He was right on target with his description of himself. But we need to be careful about labeling all Pharisees as being like the Pharisee in this parable. Not all Pharisees were self-righteous like this one. Many were faithful and humble. The Pharisees did not see themselves as an elite group. They wanted to make the observance of the Torah, the law, which is the first five books of the Bible, to be available to all people. But the way some Pharisees are depicted in some places in the New Testament has led to some anti-Semitism among some Christians. The tax collector also told the truth. He was a sinner, just as he said. Tax collectors were usually Jewish and they collected taxes on behalf of the Roman government so other Jews considered them to be traitors. And they did not simply collect taxes that were owed. They overcharged people and collected the difference. They pocketed it. I think that both the Pharisee and the tax collector needed to know that God's grace preceded everything else. The Pharisee seemed to think that he had to earn God's favor. He lived an upright life but he failed to realize that it was because of God's grace that he was accepted. I feel for the Pharisee because there are times that I feel I must live a certain way in order to be loved by God. Henry Nouwen states it well in our words for meditation today, even though they have already been heard by us, spoken so eloquently by Dave Spence. I want to read them again in order to drive them home for each of us. So you can follow along in the bulletin if you would like, or perhaps close your eyes in order to avoid distractions. Although claiming my true identity as a child of God, I still live as though the God to whom I am returning demands an explanation. I still think about God's love as conditional and about home as a place I'm not yet fully sure of. While walking home, I keep entertaining doubts about whether I will be truly welcome when I get there. As I look at my spiritual journey, my long and fatiguing trip home, I see how full it is of guilt about the past and worries about the future. I realize my failures and know that I have lost the dignity of my sonship but I am not yet able to fully believe that where my failings are great, grace is always greater. Still clinging to my sense of worthlessness, I project for myself a place far below that which belongs to a child of God. Can you relate to those words? I certainly can. So rather than judging the Pharisee, maybe we can see ourselves in him. The Pharisee does say, I thank God that I'm not like the tax collector. We can hear the self-righteousness of the Pharisee coming through. But if we aren't careful, we might think, thank God that I'm not like this Pharisee. <laughs> but what about the tax collector? 
He did repent, to use traditional religious language, but what enabled him to repent was God's grace. It's kind of like what I've heard said about forgiveness as it is stated in our common prayer. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, or we could say forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. It may sound as if that in order to be forgiven by God, that we must forgive others. But one of the things for which we need to be forgiven is the failure to forgive. And it is the grace of God that enables us to forgive others and to forgive ourselves. In a similar fashion, it wasn't because the tax collector beat his breast and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, that he was forgiven. The forgiveness was already there because of the grace of God. It's what enabled him to ask for forgiveness from God. I think of the parable of the prodigal son also. The young son left home in a spirit of rebellion against his father. Then eventually he hit bottom and he thought, I'll go home and beg my father to forgive me. I'll even say that I'm willing to work on the farm like one of his hired hands if he will receive me. What happened? His father was peering down the road and as he did every day in the hope that his son would return. And one day it happened. The father saw him coming down the road and what did the father do? He ran to his son, he embraced him and said, welcome home, let's have a big party and celebration of your return. Notice that the father did not wait to hear his son say, I'm sorry for what I have done. Please receive me back. The father welcomed him before his son could get so much as a word out of his mouth. Even when his son was away from home, the father had already forgiven him. It was because of the grace of the father that this was the case. To be sure, the younger son would not have experienced liberation from forgiveness if he hadn't gone home. But grace was always there for the waiting. So really, in the parable today of the Pharisee and tax collector, they are alike. They are both beloved children of God. And so it is with each of us and every person. Not only were the Pharisee and tax collector in today's parable beloved children of God, but so is every human being. All of us go astray at times, some of us really go astray, maybe us at times, but all of us are beloved children of God. During this political season, we need to remember that Republican and Democrat and those of every political stripe are children of God. Herschel Walker and Raphael Warnock are both beloved children of God. Ought we to take into consideration the stances of candidates? Obviously so. We should oppose many isms and phobias and policy issues are vitally important. But everyone is a beloved child of God. I recently listened to a sermon that I came across by Brene Brown on YouTube. She preached it at the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. I share some of her thoughts and intermix them with some of my thoughts. She says that the truth is that we usually have very little interest in those who don't believe as we do. We have sorted ourselves by ideology and sorted ourselves into factions. There is nothing quite like a common hatred that can unite people. Hating some people is often the way we connect. Maybe we want to tame the language just a bit and say disliking others is the way we connect, but sometimes there really is hatred. Brene Brown says that when we do this, there isn't real connection between those with whom we agree. We just hate or dislike the same people. She believes that in our highly polarized culture, there is a real crisis in spiritual connection. 
And she has an interesting definition of spirituality. Listen to it. She says that it is the deeply held belief that we are inextricably connected to each other by something greater than we are and it is something that is rooted in love and compassion. And she believes that is God. This sounds very much like what Alcoholics Anonymous say about a higher power or what we might also call God. The opposite of this is dehumanization. And I believe she is correct. We are at a time of rampant dehumanization. Now she spoke these words in 2018 and things may be even worse now than when they were then. I don't know. But we take groups of humanity and move them outside what we call human. And when we do that, we are permitted to do whatever we want to them. Think about how so many wars have begun and continued because of this. And think about what happens on Facebook, if you're on Facebook. People dehumanize those different from them. But if we are offended when someone on Facebook uses nasty words in describing Joe Biden, we ought to be just as offended if someone uses nasty words in describing Donald Trump. Ouch. I'm wrestling with that statement. Again, there can be offensive ideologies and outright wrong ones, but even those who hold them are beloved children of God. If they engage in actions that are reprehensible, then we ought to confront and even condemn those actions. But when they do these things, they are going against their true nature, I believe. We are all sinners, but I don't believe in original sin. I believe in original salvation. We stray from this at times, but the point is that we stray from our true nature. I say ouch again to something else. Brene Brown says, it's not a question of which side of politics we are on, it's a question of which side of humanity we are on. If we get to the point where we do not see the humanity in others, then we are on the wrong track. There is nothing more unholy than stripping the humanity away from a person through language or in some other way. I believe that closely tied to this is the need for humility. The Pharisee in today's parable was obviously not humble. This is revealed by the fact that his prayer was self-centered rather than God-centered. But you know, there is a danger in my saying this because my pointing a finger at the Pharisee by doing that, I'm getting close to not being humble myself. As far as the tax collector, if we aren't careful, if he weren't careful, he could have begun to see that his repentance showed that he was humble. He doesn't seem to be there now in the story, but if we aren't careful, it can happen to us even if we are more like the tax collector. We can get close, if we're not careful, to bragging about our humility. Being humble will help us remember that those who drive us crazy and those who even offend us are beloved children of God. And perhaps we also need to remember that we might be driving someone crazy ourselves. In a real sense, we are all in the same boat. We are all beloved children of God.